Well, here we are, Rach, covered in Gorringe pets. Absolutely. <laughs> the Gorringes... Well, there's one Gorringe here, Farmer Phil, but... Only one Gorringe today. But Hev isn't, and so once again, the cat is in turmoil. We had to let the cat in because it was making such a fuss outside. So before we started the day's proceedings, we've let little Noah in, and Noah's taken refuge on my co-presenter's lap <laughs> this morning. Yeah, and I think you can hear him in the background just making his little purry noises. Anyway, yeah. hello, listener. Welcome to this week's instalment of the Wiggly Podcast. And today, we haven't got Heather, because she's having a wonderful time camping in Cornwall. <laughs> and, uh, but I am joined uh, by uh, the, uh, the illustrious farmer Phil and the ever-gorgeous Rachel Jones. Thank you, Rachel. That's a very nice introduction. <laughs> For <laughs> God's sake, will you two stop? I thought so. Anyway, nice, eh? anyway so Hev, is she having a good time? Uh, um, um, well, the, well uh, I pre-warned her before she set off on this trip. She said... I'm going camping next week, Rach. She said, me and Monty. I said, Hev, forget it. You send him to scouts. That's what they do. They entertain them with camping so that you, as mummy, do not have to do this. Right. <laughs> and so she said, no, no, it'd be great fun. Never been before camping with Monty. Be great thing. Farmer yeah. Phil's combining. We don't see him all week, so we're going camping. Has she gone with a whole entourage of hobbits there? Well, there? the, the thing whole, is, I think she's taken a pile of, yeah, a pile of wiglet family yeah. with her. And uh, they all found out about this and said, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Some and of them needed more persuading than others, I have to say. Did they? They weren't <laughs> quite as keen on Did the camping they? ideal as uh, okay. Hev was, but uh, yes, yeah, so she's got a whole host of them down yeah. there. Yeah, anyway, and so uh, new after, tents were bought. Uh, new tents were bought, but yeah. I, I, I'm inclined to think that after five days of torrential rain yeah. and, uh, and no, hurricane force <laughs> winds, that they yeah. needed to remedy their ways and uh, gone off to find a suitable Hobbit home yes. instead of instead Yes, of the they have rich, yeah. yeah. I'm afraid it wasn't, didn't even make it to five days. Right. It was after day two then when they found themselves in the laundrette of the Tuesday morning, drying all their clothes, and poor Auntie Mo and two little wiglets were on the rocks, and my Granny Mo said, on the rocks, I yeah. think we're going to have to go home, <laughs> because the rain had rained exactly. <laughs> in some style. Rained, and it? the wind yeah, blew, <laughs> and their tents got crushed the poles got crushed they got so wet and so upset they did cook breakfast though they left here clutching their hiker billy cook set of which they were very proud i'm not sure phil that that happened i think they probably nipped off down the local no they did cook breakfast once i know that (laughs) whether any more cooking than that got carried out but they did achieve it once well i know that hev did quite a write-up on facebook before she went about how she was off on this wonderful yeah that's right we're using the flints and the storm kettles that's it absolutely uh, anyone could possibly need absolutely so i think they found quickly found the tourist information having nowhere left to sleep other than their cars and so they went to the tourist information and lucky lucky they found them a little place to stay it uh, gives yeah. a measure of the weather that the previous occupants of the chalet that they're now staying in had given up <laughs> holiday in <laughs> Cornwall God. and gone home, oh, which was no. why uh, the aforementioned a, chalet yeah. was vacant. The British. So you've got an yeah. interesting extra there. You're I have, in, yes. Uh, in today's yeah. Telegraph. I hope Ev doesn't pick up the Telegraph of Wednesday the 13th of August because there's an article in there about last-minute rush for a holiday in the sun and it talks about how everybody is just given up with the British summer and they're rushing to get a last minute holiday in before the kids go back to school and just one little paragraph which I'd like to read it says last month Devon County Council accused the Met Office of crying wolf over predictions of bad weather (laughs) but there was no exaggeration in its forecast for this week an inch of rain fell in three hours yesterday in Devon and Cornwall, <laughs> and I think it all landed on Hev's tent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we did. So Heather, uh, the Dragon of Posse, will be back this weekend, hmm. and they'll be back on the uh, Wiggly. Well, so Heather certainly will be back on the Wiggly sofa next next week. Yeah, absolutely. Right, right. So there's a couple of things I wanted to ask you. Right mm. now, unfortunately, I've had to condescend to Sarah, my Sarah, having a horse, and she's got this horse coming on trial. And we've had big debates about this horse, but uh, I've given in effectively so, so, we've, so, we've, so we've got a horse coming uh, called Joey which is a slightly unfortunate name but still there you are. fantastic uh, but fantastic. it is on trial so hopefully it, it will be a complete disaster and uh, it'll only be with us for a week <laughs> do you say that Rich I'll send my Gemma who's quite horsey experienced uh, around to put right yeah, any problems yeah, so right. that she keeps it longer <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the things that's, that's, that bugs me 
is my friends and neighbours who have got a pallet next door, who Sarah goes riding with all the time, are constantly marvelling me about the ragwort that I've got growing. Well, no, I don't intentionally leave it there, but I don't intentionally pluck it from the ground either. Mm. And ragwort's in abundance this year. Yeah, I've seen loads of it. As you're driving along the motorways and that, there is so much ragwort this year. I think it must have been a particularly good year for it. I mean, we've got ragwort all over the place. It's spreading round here because of the margins that we're obliged to leave. Yeah, now but it's... interestingly, it's a notifiable weed, so it's actually illegal to allow it to flourish. Right, yeah. it is a notifiable weed. Yeah. So uh, because of that, in, in all reality, what you should do as a landowner is it's your responsibility to take it out of the equation. Absolutely. Right. Now, it's poisonous to horses. Only under certain circumstances. Ah. As in? No, this is interesting here, you mm. see. This, uh, because... I have big debates with Neil about this ragwort and how poison it is, and he curses me for letting it alone. But the reason I leave it is because I see a proliferation of cinnabar moth caterpillars on the ragwort, and they love it. And I think the populations of cinnabar moths are often governed by the amount of ragwort that you see. I mean, they do like other things like grandson and stuff like that as well. But ragwort, they adore. So I'm thinking, well, I'll go and pluck my ragwort out of the ground, and then my, I won't see those beautiful little daytime flying moths. So I kind of I went onto web this morning and thought, right, I need to get some hard and fast facts. I sound like you, Rich, to go and get some hard and fast facts. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, um, no. <laughs> it's like changing behaviour, possibly. But it's an interesting one because while this particular website makes reference to the fact that ragwort has a certain toxicity and it is poisonous, it accuses the media of overemphasising how poisonous it is and how many animal deaths occur off the back of ragwort. Have you heard of any horses or any animals having been poisoned by ragwort in, the, in the, all the time that you've been farming? No, no, I haven't. But I do know that every owner of a horse that I know pulls it up, so they have no chance of getting to it. Right. So I suppose you can't really take any. I was always from that. brought up to believe that when it's in its fresh state growing, it's either not poisonous or the horse won't eat it. The dangerous time is if you cut it and wilt it, and then it's deadly. Actually, Phil, I would concur with you there because. In these notes, it does say, and there's some good references here, so it seems like a fairly factual piece of literature, but it does say that uh, most of the poisoning problems occur through feeding animals hay mm. that, that ragwort is, uh, is, is in. Or alternatively, if you top the pasture, which is actually quite an effective way of stopping it seeding because it only tends to throw up its seed heads once, and if you cut them off when they're in flower, that'll stop it seeding. I was also brought up to believe that if an animal gets a taste for a wilted piece of ragwort, it'll seek it out. It's not like an addiction, but it, it really wants it and it can't resist eating more of it. Mm. And like that's... chocolate. Yeah, very similar. <laughs> right? Chocolate to a horse. <laughs> but I think it's not only horses. I mean, it, it won't do cattle or sheep any good either. But, of course, as you mentioned... sheep tend to ignore it, don't they? More well, it, it, they'll ignore it growing. Most animals, I, I don't know of any animals that'll eat it standing up. It's when it's wilted that it's dangerous. But, of course, the biggest problem is that each of these big, sort of, bushy yellow flower heads can produce a myriad of seeds which blow all over the place. And this is where, as you commented, we've got it on the motorways. Well, no, we're not mm. going to graze the motorways or make hay out of them, but they're effectively seeding all the surrounding farmland. Mm. And the conservation strips that are being put in are really easy places for ragwort to colonise. There's an interesting thing here. It says uh, about the fact that ragwort scenes are, are windblown. Um, and there's a certain amount of research gone on to see how far the windblown seeds are transported. It states a couple of studies, one certainly in New Zealand, where the behaviour of around 57 million seeds was studied. Quite uh, how they <laughs> study uh, that sort of quantity of seeds is, is, uh, is, is something that I'm unaware of. But it's what it says here, and uh, like you say, Phil, uh, well, like Michael said earlier, if it's on the web, it must be true. <laughs> it says the amount of seed recovered from the trays in the central area, essentially at the base of the trans, indicated that approximately... 33,900,000 seeds were deposited at the base of the plants. This is approximately 60% of the total seed produced. The ground in many places within the central enclosure was thickly covered with seed. A considerable quantity of seed was retained within the seed heads. This was estimated to be about 22,800,000 seeds. So from that you can assume that the larger proportion of the seed was transported a very small distance. It also talks about another study carried out by scientists at the Oregon State University. And it says here that when tested in a variety of conditions, 31% of the seeds travelled only one metre. 89% of them 5 metres or less, 
and none were collected more than 14 metres from source. So, reading between the lines, you could assume that the seed is invariably deposited quite close to the ground. Yeah, I mean, so I, it I think the, travel that, the encroachment that is quite slow. Yeah. But, of course, we've always had ragwort in places like woods and where it's you know less likely to be worried about it too much. And you get the encroachment in here. It definitely comes from the woods. I also think the seeds have probably got an ability to lie dormant for a long time because certainly in some of our set-aside ground where there isn't any ragwort near it and there certainly wasn't any ragwort when it was cultivated, that it's now come up with ragwort. Now, I don't think that seed blew in from anywhere. I think it was in the ground and that while there might have been a couple of plants a couple of years ago and they managed to multiply and then there are now more. And obviously there are vectors such as animals and whatever else trundling around that can carry seeds about the place. What is more worrying is that it's a difficult plant to kill. Physical means, you know, cultivation will do it in. Sprays aren't a whole heap of use. It's not a plant that's very susceptible to many chemicals. Right, that's interesting. And therefore, physical control is about the, the only way, which it is, is where you go and pull it up. It is easy isn't it? Because it is very shallow-rooted. So you have to be careful, it. though, because the, the sap, if you get it on your hands, some people can come up with a really nasty reaction. It's, a, it's similar to whatever that stuff is that we have by the river, the balsam or the okay, hogweed. Okay, you mean the hogweed. The juice off that is... And ragwort juice, you, some people get steaming headaches and things like that from pulling ragwort. You live in the Woolhope Dome area. Yeah. Is, is there a lot in that area? There is. So well, that you wouldn't feel so bad pulling yours up? It's, it's like anything, anything in, in moderation. So I suppose yeah. if you've got a pasture adjacent to where horses are being kept, then yeah. it's not unreasonable to pull I think, Rach, it's out. probably yeah. fairly safe to say that with the arrival of Joey, <laughs> yes. I think that uh, Sarah has <laughs> Joey, maintained the upper hand absolutely. and the ragwort on which his patch <laughs> will be I getting think, pulled up. So probably at this very moment in time, Sarah is out there with a well, bag pulling it up. No, anyway. no, I think it'll be rich who has to pull it up. <laughs> we went down there and Sarah said, the first thing she said was, oh, um, on Sunday, do you, do you think we could put a rail here so I could tack the horse up? So that's one job on Sunday. Yeah, that's And Sunday. then it was, is this ragwort here, Rich? Mm. Um, yes, yeah. it is, uh, Sarah. Mm, we should pick that up, shouldn't we? Yes, yes, uh, yes sir. Yes. Oh, Rich obviously hasn't. Yeah. And then, of course, I've got this. I've got a hose. Yeah. I've got extension on the hose to do yes. for the drinking and all yeah. this kind of stuff. You know I, the very... Originally, I said, I, you know, I don't want a horse because I don't want it. But do you know the best bit? Bit of life, the bit of freedom. <laughs> the bit of freedom I, have in my I do life. have. Yeah. He's, he's worried about rails and hose pipes. Yes, he has not that's... yet got as far as no. the equine outfitters. Do you know how untidy <laughs> horses are oh, eating, Rich? Oh, I mean, they are really untidy eating animals, aren't they? Do you know how expensive? Bridges and yeah. horse yeah. tack and all and the rest saddles. Of it. Yeah. Oh, saddles. Oh, no. Get and on eBay, you've Rich. Got have, <laughs> you've got <laughs> to have the trendy piece. hat. Yes. Yeah, the old hat isn't good enough. No. You've got to have a new one every so often. <laughs> and the boots and the spats. Oh, and yep. You'll be off to badminton, Rich. Uh, it's making me feel ill. Let's uh, let's uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's move on. He says. <laughs> let's move on. Now, uh, I could supply delight. you with a bit of horse food if you like. It's quite pricey. It's the way, isn't it? You know, No, I mean, actually, I was going to say that Sarah. Sarah goes on to me about my fishing trips, but she doesn't. So uh, so I suppose I can't even even use that. You get the sense there's been a bit of a discussion on the qualities of this marriage. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you you will be left to pick up the mess, Rich, which is what happens. When's the cat arriving? (laughs) Such is the compromise. No, that that is one thing that I I draw the line at. No, No moggies in our patch. I peeked over the fence this morning yes. in, in this little bit of summer sunshine that's really nice, warming our backs. And in the pasture next to the pond, there are two little piggies. Ah, oh, that's a home of Wigglies, isn't it? So this, is, yeah. this is back in the back Wiggly, in Wiggly world. Back yeah. in Wiggly world, um, the piggies have arrived. They're gorgeous. They are gorgeous. Yeah. Absolutely gorgeous. When did you um, get them, Phil? I got them the day before yesterday. So one of the days this week that yeah. it was teeming down with Tuesday. rain. Tuesday. Yeah. No, we went over on Tuesday morning and picked them up. They're a little bit smaller than the ones we had they last are, year. They're, but they're, they're yeah. a little bit smaller, aren't they? Same breed, so one large black and one Tamworth. And they've settled in a treat. They were in their pig arc within three hours of getting them home, having a bit of a snooze after their eventful morning. <laughs> they are intelligent little guys. Will yeah. you be putting rings in their nose this time? Because they did make quite a mess of your field last they year. They did. I don't think I will, no. I, I think they made most of the mess in their, their last month of life. And... 
they since did, I yeah. think I left slaughtering them about a month too long, in as much that they were over fat when we slaughtered them, I think we'll slaughter these ones a little bit younger, and hopefully they'll do less damage, and we'll have a slightly better meat to fat yeah. ratio. Yeah, they did. They did seem to become very destructive in the last month of. of <laughs> well, they were so there. strong. They were. I mean, they can stick their snout in the ground to about a four-inch depth no. and just move through it. I mean, <laughs> it, it makes yeah. Charlie Dimmock and a turfing spade look totally yeah. inefficient, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, fantastic. Well, it's good to see them back. Well, Rich, moving on, I suppose we ought to have a little chat about the Wiggly Garden here. The Wiggly Garden? Yeah, we've got, as everybody knows, probably listeners, maybe not all of them know, we've got a really nice walled garden at the back of Heather's house here. But anyway, in the raised bed area, we've got quite a few nice veg growing. And in fact, Hannah gave me some courgettes yesterday to take home because they were, oh, they were absolutely beautiful. Fried in butter, gorgeous. But yesterday, I turned up some plants from Fengolan. Oh, Fenton Farm, Fenton Golan, yeah. Fenton Golan Farm yeah. for you to plant in okay. the raised beds. Oh, uh, right, my plugs have arrived. Yes, Excellent. they're in the cool room. The plan is our uh, veggie uh, selections, our veggie plug selections, that have, that have been really successful this year, very, very popular. We're going to do them again next year, obviously, but perhaps size down a few of those selections. And one thing we're going to do is sell selections in keeping with our raised beds. So the raised beds that we make... We're going to sell selections to go with those so you can buy your raised bed and your compost and your plants so the whole kit and caboodle oh, be to fun. begin with. Yeah, because yeah, so some of the customer feedback has been that the plots have been a little bit too big. Yeah. So it will be great to have them to Well, go some of them, them have been almost sufficient to plant up half an acre, which is... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, it feels fine. Which is probably a slightly uh, optimistic. Have you been right, um, <laughs> on the old maths again, Rich? Is that what's happened here? <laughs> That's right, yeah, me and, me and arithmetic. And uh, <laughs> the, the, um, the idea is that uh, folks can buy smaller packs in effect so these what I'm going to do with these is in fact this afternoon as I was hoping Hannah would be around the end of this week but she's not but what I'm going to do is venture out into the garden and get some of those bags of compost and I'm going to plant those up because by the end of the autumn or mid-autumn the plants that I'm going to put in there which remain a mystery to me until I see what we've got oh well I've seen the packets uh, they're fab they're lettuce they're right. kale they're all sorts they're good. all sorts of things pertinent for this yeah. time of year really yeah. um, when they come to fruition and fill those raised beds then Michael will use some of of his photographic wizardry to get some images for the next year's catalogue. Great. I understand you've had some potatoes out of the garden. Yeah, we've, well, we've been eating potatoes steadily, but um, the other day Hannah brought me some of the blue variety that we both sold and have obviously grown in the garden, so that they're sort of a dark purple skin with a blue flesh inside their heritage variety. What I did notice was that the skins on them from our garden were a little bit scabby, that may be in part due to the variety, that the older varieties may be more susceptible. But I asked my friend Ian what this was likely to be, and he said, well, there are two likely causes. That One, if the soil was a little bit dry at tuber initiation, that tends to cause scab. And, of course, in a raised bed, that is something that could be an issue because a raised bed would tend to be drier than better drainage. Just, just out mm. in, in, in the garden. And the other thing he said was that you ought to check the lime status of the soil, that if the soil is too acidic, that tends to encourage scab as well. So a bit late for this year, but obviously for next year, those were two pointers that were worth remembering, that if you're growing potatoes at the point where the little tiny tubers are just starting to grow on the bottom, you have to make sure that they're well watered at that point, and that will help alleviate the scab problem. I've got two raised beds at home, and the one is filled with gritty-type soil, and if I plant potatoes in there they tend to come out all shapes and sizes Mm. and quite scabby. Mm. So that could be something to do with it as well. Mm. The other thing, of course, the other important thing is rotation, that if you have potatoes in the same soil too often, things like scab will get worse and worse. So that really you ought to leave at least four and probably five, and if you can, more years between each crop of potatoes in the same bit of soil. Yeah. It's usually, yeah. A year, usually a four-year four rotation of potatoes, and then you follow Farming, the that would be considered well. tight. We've got some land that, that's had potatoes with a four-year break, and it's got to the point where you don't really want to grow potatoes in Is it. that from a, which, uh, an assortment of reasons? Or? It, just a b- build-up of disease. The worst thing is that you can end up with potato cyst nematode, which is a very expensive pest to control. But you tend to get poorer skin quality each crop 
that you grow so that the longer you can extend the rotation the better skin finish that you'll get right but this year of course with this weather blight is starting to show its it's head again and that of course is a a major problem it's it really is a major problem for those who try to grow their potatoes organically because obviously you haven't got much defense against it yeah i've seen a field of potatoes up the road here that's looking particularly sickly because the water is just hanging there i don't know what's happened to that field i know the field you mean i think he may have had an upset with the fertiliser placement. There was a lot of problem this year with potatoes dying. We had a very heavy spell of rain fairly soon after a lot of them were planted and the soil slumped and the potatoes, instead of growing, rotted. And that's why some of these crops are looking a bit gappy. Well, what does potato blight look like? Well, it's a kind of black canker, I suppose. And you, on the you, leaves? Yeah, on the leaves. It usually, uh, usually you see the start of blight appearing along the base of the plant and the leaves curl up and blacken and start to die off, shrivel up, and then eventually the whole top of the plant blackens and, uh, and dies and, and shrinks and turns into a horrible slimy mess. But, of course, you really want to cut your corns off before it gets to that state and burn them. Yeah, so the, at that point, the potato itself is no good. So you can eat the potato, but yeah. if, you le- if you leave it, because I think what happens with the blight, it tends to go down into the root after it's infected the foliage. If you cut the top off a blighted potato but don't dig the roots up, that any of the tubers that are going to rot will rot in the ground and they'll disintegrate. So that when you dig it, the healthy tubers that you get out, of which there will be some, they will be absolutely fine, and the ones that are going to rot will have rotted. The danger is if you dig it fresh, to the eye they will look perfectly fine. And to eat at that point they will be fine. But if you put them in a bag to store or something... The rots will go rotten, and then they, go, they make the whole bag mm. go wrong. Mm. So the important thing is to not put a potentially rotten potato into storage. So you've got to either give it a chance to rot out in the garden, or eat it, or, if you can, prevent the blight in the first place. But it spreads so quickly. Some of these potato crops are getting a blight spray every five days now, which is Gosh. a lot of work. And that, that's how close you have to bring the sprays together, because blight comes in and goes through its life cycle so quickly... When the pressure gets up, you have to spray and spray and spray. Yeah, so you're talking on a commercial point of view, from farming point of view, whereas we're talking little back garden, raised bed areas in general, the person should try and take off... Absolutely. Take, or if, Take if, the greenery off the top and then of eat their potatoes. The, to be perfectly honest, though, we may have slightly overcomplicated growing potatoes. Yes, I think <laughs> probably actually, so, because I'm thinking, wow, I've got to spray really all these times. <laughs> I can't be doing this really all the time. Every year you put your potatoes <laughs> yeah. in the ground and you end yeah. up with loads of potatoes. In yeah. fact, they're probably the simplest things to grow imaginable. Yeah. So, uh, so what we <laughs> so want to do is, for the listener, is not to overcomplicate things and start to worry about the complexities of growing potatoes. It sounds to me like rotation is the important thing rotation of your spuds all important now one thing i did this morning because another thing we've got in the wiggly garden is a patch of wild flowers and there's a predominance of knapweed of course in there this year now this morning because it was such a lovely morning and and i felt as though it, it could almost be summer i ventured out and we've got a proliferation of goldfinches at the moment all right the way around the house now we we commented just that we haven't seen many around the wiggly garden this year and I'm wondering that's because they're on the other side of Herefordshire, right? Oh, right by me, possibly. But, but, house. But, um, uh, no, like, I, I must say, I haven't seen as many this year as last year. We had absolutely flocks of them here, didn't we? Yeah, there were a lot You could see, year. every time you looked out the window, you saw them. Charms of goldfinches. Charms of goldfinches. But I haven't seen hardly any this time. No. Anyway, I benched out my little iPod, and I've got a little sound bite all about goldfinches. Well, it's a most beautiful morning. You could almost think it was summer. After so many days of rain, the sun is out. I almost woke up this morning and I thought, oh, that's not bad for an autumn day. Of course, you know, we're in the middle of August. And you could just hear that twitter, twitter. There's a beautiful flock of goldfinches feeding on the knapweed below the house. And there's a mix. You know, there's a whole bunch of juveniles and adults. And they're stuffing their faces, and this is a patch I deliberately leave. I don't graze it or anything, you know, it's quite a big area. A uh, lot of ragwort, teasels, and uh, oxide daisies, which there's still a few out, oddly, but most have gone over now. And uh, some creeping thistle. 
but these little goldfinches are teetering, balancing on those woody stems of the knapweed, much of which has gone over now, but um, probably, a, uh, probably about two thirds of it is still very vibrant, still in flower. Long flowers or lesser knapweed flowers for a long period throughout the, throughout the summer. It's gorgeous stuff. Um, there's a mass in the paddock above the, above the house. Unfortunately, what happens is when the sheep go on there, which is any time now, within the next couple of days, as soon as Richard's vaccinated for blue tongue, they come in and the first thing they do is nibble off the heads off all the knapweed. But this patch here is safe because the sheep can't get in here. There's nothing in there above my washing line. But it just goes to show, you know, I mean, you, you spend a lot of money on uh, Niger seed. Niger seed feeders for goldfinches and the goldfinch populations have done so well off the back of uh, people feeding them over the last few years um, but it's nice to have uh, if, you've, if you've got the space or even if you've got a, a relatively small patch of ground just put just put a few clumps of knapweed in there it looks great and uh, all you need to do is cut it off in you know, October time and Wiggly Garden's got a classic patch of knapweed in the bottom corner it grows enormous I mean this is it this is quite a contrast here we've got knapweed that's oh, I don't know tallest probably about 18 inches whereas uh, in, the, in the Wiggly Garden it's four foot tall <laughs> there's a difference in the nutrient levels it's a real nutrient sink at Wiggly's but here it's on very shallow soils on a, on a limestone well it's old uh, old Silurian limestone upwelling it's just great to see these little guys they're little red faces and they're just meticulously plucking each seed from the heads of the flowers. Great sight. Sarah's office now it looks out on this patch and so she's watching these flocks of these wonderful yellow flecked, twittering, very sociable little finches. Funny, uh, Sarah's grandfather told me one Christmas, he's, he's, he's died now, but uh, he, um, he he sat down, he was telling me about when he was a kid and how, how he used to make money from going and making uh, jam, which they used to smear on the branches of trees to catch all these little songbirds, you know, and sell them to, to people to put in cages. Oh, it wasn't so long ago. But you see, then there were a lot of finches about because farming was done in a way that supported a lot of wildlife and obviously since the agricultural revolution finch numbers have plummeted but over recent years again because of human intervention artificial feeding you know people taking the dime and having a little bit more extra income to afford some packs of niger seed and the like they've done well again wonderful well that was great rich that was oh. bloody good, Rich. Oh, well done. <laughs> well done. Well done. Well, yeah, thanks for that, guys. That's yeah, it, no fun. Before we wrap up and finish, I just want your views on the boys against the girls with the medal situation at the Olympics. So what is the situation with the medals at the Olympics, Rach? I'm not um, conscious of what's going on, really. Well, I think it's 5-2 to the girls. 5-2 to the girls? Yeah. In terms of medals or in yeah. terms of gold Med or something? Uh, medals. Medals, right. Oh, there's plenty of time to go yet. I think they're pretty much oh. all doing rather better than expectations. I tell you what, I've always thought that I've never really been interested in the Olympics, but the last couple of evenings, you know, there's been the, the best of the day, you know, just around tea time. Yeah. So I kind of sat down and watched <laughs> it, and I, was, I really enjoyed it. And I'll tell you Good. what I did enjoy, is that the uh, gymnastics on the, on the beam. My God, mm -hmm. isn't that the most impressive thing I've ever seen? How can you possibly do a whole world of yeah. flips and, and spurts and jumps? and land on something that's, that's uh, six foot off the ground that's only four inches wide. It's amazing. entertaining Absolutely seeing you amazing. try, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps we could have the next <laughs> Wiggly video cast as Rich on the beam. I could find a bit of sleeper or something <laughs> to practice yeah, on. Or the raised bed. I'll give it a go. <laughs> Side <laughs> of the raised bed, Rich. The only thing is that we'd have to see Rich in a leotard, which might be not quite... <laughs> no, 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 so it's bye from me. Bye from me. And bye from me. Before we wrap up and finish, I just want your views on the boys against the girls with the medal situation at the Olympics. I mean, what are you doing? Well, I don't know. I was watching the cycling the other day and all the boys gave up and Nicola Cook won. 
I know she's from Wales, so mm. it does stick in my I mean, throat a on. little bit. But I mean, get behind them. You know, what are you doing? Get behind the girls. Oh, the girl. Oh no, <laughs> that's not. That, right? <laughs> Turn your bad choice of words. Wrong words. There's the outtake. <laughs> yes.